Welcome to week one of social marketing, where the emphasis of the course is going to be on using commercial marketing tools and techniques, either as they stand or with modification, to solve problems in the name of social change. So this is the overview of what we're going to be dealing with for this video, video lecture. I'm going to start with a little bit of background. So the first thing that we want to make certain that we're all on the same page on is the definition and the understanding of commercial marketing. Now, there are two definitions that you can work with. There's the American Marketing Association 2007 definition, which is on screen at the moment. And the key ideas for us as social marketers and some of the influential ideas here have been this notion of value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. This spreads marketing away from being just a single purpose for the organization to a larger, more aware, but also more influential process and force. So for this, for social marketing, if we think of the customer as the end user of the social change, the client possibly as the person who benefits from that end use. Now, so these can be the same people, customer and client. If you are doing this as an exercise program to improve the health of teenage children, the teenagers would be customer. At the same time, their parents could well be the clients of that campaign if the aim is to reduce a preventable disease or preventable illness that will reduce medical costs or bring healthier children, happier children. So you can separate consumption and benefits to look at customer and client in separate areas. The other aspect that's of interest to us is the pocket marketing mix here create, communicate, deliver, and exchange. This is an alternative approach to the marketing mix. Uh, it's not a full standalone mix in its own right. But if you think about the role of social marketing as being creating, communicating, delivering, and facilitating the exchange of some offer that facilitates social change. So we create something, we make something, a behavior, an idea, or a physical good, or a service that is of value in order, and this value and the exchange of value becomes really important when we start looking at competitive offers. The second definition of marketing that's up your sleeve that you can use is you can use the Chartered Institute of Marketing's 2005 definition. And this comes with its own uh, pocket mantra of identify, anticipate, satisfy. Profitably uh, also is occasionally referred to as efficiently and effectively. So there are some variations to this definition floating around the field. But basically this is more of the organizational approach where you are looking here at market research consumer behavior around identify and anticipate and satisfy being about more delivery and exchange. So with commercial marketing now down, it's time to talk about how we define social marketing. Now, the first thing that needs to be brought to the forefront is that simultaneously there are many definitions of social marketing. At the same time, there is one unified, agreed upon central definition from the three major global social marketing organizations. So the ISMA et al 2013 definition is the global definition, but there are plenty of competitive alternatives that you can use. So in terms of the ISMA, ESMA, and AASM, 
There's the International Social Marketing Association, the European Social Marketing Association, and the Australian Association of Social Marketing. This definition is heavily influenced by the AMA 2007 and a lot of the precursor definitions. In terms of breaking this down and into component parts, one of the key things to think about in this is that this is a broad toolkit that allows for non-marketing approaches to work in parallel as part of social marketing. That in itself is an ideological position not all of us in social marketing share. So whilst it's a central part of the definition, it is also a contested area. It is behavioural, and the behavioural focus is on the benefit to individuals and community. There is the idea of it being for a greater good, and greater social good is a contested field and a contested definition. And it's also guided by ethical principles. Research, best practice, theory, audience and partnership insight. And it's those midpoints, research, best practice and theory that drive this subject. Social marketing has a very strong theoretical base, a very strong use of theory in practice. Many social marketing reports that are written by organizations and by practitioners come with reference lists and bibliographies because Theory is integral to the way in which we address the world. So when I ask you citations, I ask you to use references, what I'm saying to you is engage in industry standard practice. Now, a couple of the other definitions that are out in operation. Uh, one of them is mine. It is the former official definition from the AASM. And from 2010 to 2013, I was the, my definition was the definition of social marketing in Australia. Inside my definition, one of the things I do is I do sub-component, sub-category definitions. And this in itself is about clarity and clarification. So when occasionally I will talk to you about you know, specify your terms or when you use a phrase, give a definition to it, give a reference to that definition. That is because if we are not sharing a common language, we're not going to agree, even if we're using the same words, it won't be the same practice. And just briefly to look at a couple of the footnotes, one of the footnotes that's in here is the idea of having to actually specify induce versus influence. So on this, I talk about social marketing as a means to induce behavioral change. The sub-definition influence comes with a note to the fact that social marketing must have an outcome under my definition. It's not enough to simply raise an awareness or get people predisposed. If we're going to do it, we've got to do it right. And there's got to be difference in the way in which we act and we behave. It's also behavioral change gets a, um, a specification that you can change your behavior, increase, minimize, maintain a behavior, keep at current level, or ask for a behavior to be ceased. Do more, do less, do the same, stop doing it at all. So these are all defined and subdefined. And you can read the paper and read the, the footnotes on this. And it's done so that I know that people understand where I'm coming from and what my framework is. A couple of the other available definitions. Uh, there's the Lee Rothschild and Smith which starts lighting up, you can see some of the precursor elements that lead to the ISMA's definition, both in mine, my 210, 
and there 2011. We have the classic definition, which is where it all began. And this one comes with a couple of interesting footnotes of design, so it's a deliberate programs calculated to influence the acceptability of social ideas. So this is a mind changer. This is not a behavior changer, it's a mind changer. By 95, and 90, the Andreas in 95 is one of the most influential definitions on the way I present social marketing. So I'll give you a little more background on this so you know where I have come from as a practitioner and a theorist in social marketing. But this comes up with, the, again, the notion of the voluntary behavior to improve their personal welfare and that of society. Within Andreasen's definition, there was a subcategorization as well. Andreasen brought out and highlighted some key points around we adapt to commercial technology, it's programmatic, it's behavioral, but it only has to influence, it doesn't have to change. And as a small footnote, Andreasen puts this out in 95. In 2008, he and I go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a conference in Brighton, UK, where he says it should be influence behavior, and I say, no, I'm sticking with induce, because my definition has a metric, your definition has an improved attitude. And it's an ideological split between the 95, Andreasen, and the 210, Dan. So both of them cover social marketing, but both of us disagree on that key central idea. Everything else we are absolutely aligned with, but we have a difference, and it's an ideological difference, and it separates our two definitions. A couple of the other definitions that are influential, and French and Blair Stevens, 2005, this definition comes out of the United Kingdom. It is the foundational definition that influenced the British National Centre for Social Marketing, or the National Social Marketing Centre, SMC. They, Jeff French uh, is also the founder and ongoing manager of the World Social Marketing Conferences, and Clive Blair Stevens was the um, influential brains behind the National Centre. So these two, when they set a definition here, this influenced most of British health policy. The National Health Service, the NHS, most of their health policies that involve social marketing were influenced by this definition from 2005 through to about 2014, 2015. Theirs comes with a sub, again, a couple of sub goals, sub components. Everything's got to be towards a social good. So, the last one up in the definition sets that I want to put in here is a very familiar looking uh, frame. And that is Smith 2006. Bill Smith goes and takes the AMA 2004 definition of commercial marketing and converts it, adapts it, and adopts it for use in social marketing. Now, the important things here are what you do with your social marketing definition, why you need to care. The top of the list is that each definition influences the way in which you can operate as a social marketer. So there are there is a book of definitions. There is a book of social marketing definitions. It run runs up to about 210. Uh, it's being updated at the moment. I know, because I'm updating it. This definition list is a shopping list. You pick one out of this. You, you then use that. Learn it. Understand it. Read its origin paper. Read the paper it came from. 
break it down into its elements, see what it influences, what it lets you do, what it gets you to emphasize, but also what it prevents you from doing. If you take an Andreasen definition, you can only influence behavior. If you take a Dan definition, you can induce behavior. You can have an outcome that is, I am positively predisposed towards behavior, and under Andreasen, the job's done. Under Dan, the job is not complete. So that will change how you operate. So pick your definition, adopt your definition, and run with it. Now, into some of the heavy, -handed, heavy end of the hammer theory stuff. Inside social marketing, as well as our definitional domain, we have three focal points. We have downstream social marketing, and this is where our theories, practices, and campaigns are focused on the individual end user. This is where consumer behavior is very important. We have midstream social marketing, which is where we are looking at group-based behavioral influence. We're not going directly to an end party, we're going through a mediator, or through a broker, or through a, a key influencer. So we start getting some business-to-business -business theory coming in here. We start getting some group dynamic. We also have upstream social marketing. And this is where we operate with public policy, with other institutions. So this is where you can see, even in the definitions, the ISMA's definition really draws on an upstream social marketing framework because it's marketing plus other methods for social change. Upstream marketing uh, in social marketing also is an adaptation of the Goldberg 1995 uh, version of commercial upstream. In Goldberg's 95 framework, he talks about the idea of Upstream marketing being about growing the size of the overall market rather than competing for a larger slice of an individual, of a small market. In social marketing, quite often we use upstream to reduce the size of an overall market. That we can do positive or negative upstream, but effectively, your domains here, we can target one of three levels. We can target multiple levels at one time, but quite often your research papers or your practice or your campaigns will intentionally be downstream or midstream or upstream. And there are ethical considerations to be discussed around all of these. So it's worth reading around them. So in terms of what we do as social marketers, uh, the definition about who we are, Currently, and I'm going to emphasize this, currently we focus on behaviors. Previously at the foundation of the, of the discipline, we focused on ideas. Around the mid 80s, around 1985, Craig LeFay produces a paper, uh, LeFay and several others produce a series of papers that go from attitude change to behavior change, and it shifts the whole discipline. So. What we also have, though, consistent throughout, is that we are about systematic planning. Social marketing is a conscious and deliberate act. When we go, we go having thought it through, mapped it out, and with a backup. We also use segmentation. It's just, you're not a social marketer if you're not doing market segmentation. We don't believe in mass market as a principle. We know that we quite often deal with massive market problems. We deal with wicked problems. But each time we look at it and say, how do we break this up into smaller, accessible, targetable, actionable market segments? And the other area that we talk about is we talk about positive benefit. And this is a contested area. Good 
is not objective. There is no objective measure of good. Anyone who tells you there's an objective measure of good probably isn't good. Because they don't want you questioning, they don't want you looking at the impact, they want you obeying. Question if someone says there's an objective good. All right, what we do in terms of focus on behaviors, these are the outcomes we're looking for. So as marketers, as commercial marketers, usually our outcomes are along the lines of buy a product, consume a product. Consume a product in a new, different way that means you have to buy more copies of that product. Here, for us, here's some other theory. Here's some other frameworks. What we want to be able to do is pick, if we're going to focus on a behavioral-led definition, you want to pick one of these behaviors as an outcome or sequence them as an outcome. For example, if you want to get someone to give up smoking, and instead of smoking, if they feel the need to smoke, to chew gum, you pretty much got everything on that list. You want them to abandon an undesirable behavior, the smoking. You want them to accept a new behavior, chewing the gum. And really, you're somewhere between switch between behaviors. Give up smoking, take up gum switch over between the two, and eventually you want them to abandon the gum. So you get to use multiples, but at any given point for not just simplicity, but for effectiveness, for ethics, for ethical effectiveness, focus on one of these. You can have a sub-priority, but focus on one behavioral change. In terms of what we do and why it's different from our mates over in commercial marketing. Commerce is easy. Commercial marketing is great. We only care about your wallet. We get your money, we go home. We're done. Social marketing, we're after your mind. We're after your behavior. We're after how you think, how you perceive the world, how you interact with the world. Commerce wants the money, we want your mind and your behavior. All actions are predicated on some form of cognitive, emotive, or automated decision process. So we assume that if we can get you to think, we can get you to behave. Now the other areas that we run into is market selection in social marketing quite often is problematic to the nth degree because we quite often will address the least responsive market because they're the market with the greatest perceived need. We also do a lot of decisions that are based around what is politically expedient or politically valuable for our funding agents and our overlords. If the government, if you're working for a government campaign, you can have the best laid out campaign of all time. And if the minister comes in and goes, no, I want you to target, and they name another audience, you are targeting that audience. That's how it goes. In the same way that if the CEO walks in and says, that's a lovely product you're making there, I don't want to deal with that market, make something different, the CEO gets that say. It's just we tend to have more political things happen. The last thing is the competition. This is really important to consider is that most of the time in commercial marketing, you are taking on an opponent, a clearly stated opponent. If Coca-Cola says that it is in the business of being the most, the number one beverage consumed on the planet, then it can tell you that its competitor is water, coffee, tea, and every other soft drink. Whereas you know, over in social marketing, quite often our competitor is the current behavior someone's doing. So we want someone to give up smoking. We're not just competing against the smoking manufacturers, the cigarette manufacturers. We're competing against the benefits that person gets from smoking and benefits they get from being themselves doing their own thing. 
So we're going to better that offer in the marketplace. And this is why we have the oh hell moment. As marketers, in social marketing, on a regular basis, we will ask people to be uncomfortable. Physically uncomfortable. An exercise regime, walk 30 minutes a day, do, don't take the lifts, take the stairs. Yeah, your knees will not thank you. Eventually, they will thank you. But in that first instance, we want you to be uncomfortable. We want you to be awkward. We want you to feel nervous. We want you to respond to people, to be the social level. To, particularly where we're getting you to lead off in a social campaign, we're going to ask you to be socially awkward by not doing the thing all your peers are doing. We want you to reduce pleasure. Most of the hedonic consumption patterns do not sit in our radar of things we want people to do. Occasionally, social marketing is affectionately referred to as the prevention of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I say affectionately because we're the ones the social marketers who tend to call it that. We also want you to spend more time, because time's a thing we all have, right? But in spending more time, we also because we want you to do things like prepare meals rather than buy meals. That's spending time. We want you to walk for 30 minutes, which is also the topping and tailing 15 minutes either side. So the hour we get you to spend to do half an hour of activity. We want you to resist peer pressure except where we want you to adhere to peer pressure. So we tell you both, be your own person. Winners, don't do drugs. Stand on your own. Also, the entire societal norm says don't do this. We want you to hear bad news. Social marketers rarely roll in with good news. The day we get to go and announce that bacon cures cancer is the best day ever. Except for if you happen to be Jewish, in which case it's a absolutely rubbish day if you're Jewish or uh, Muslim because a kosher or halal food that cures cancer is absolute rubbish and bad news all around. So it's not even a good day when it's a good day. We also ask you to risk relationships, peers, friends, family. If we're going to get you to change your behavior and that behavior is popular in your community, we're going to make you an outcast. We're going to hope that you bring the rest of your community with you. We also get you to give up leisure time. We get you to give up looking good. Nobody looks attractive at certain points in any given exercise campaign or regime. But also, there is a point in time when we are actually honestly looking at the situation going, yeah, it's not going to be pretty. Lastly, as well as all of this, we ask you to learn new skills. And quite often we don't train you with those new skills. And yet, we succeed. So here's how it works. Customer orientation is key. We win these street battles against superior funded opponents because if we go to the audience and listen, we can make a better offer. And that better offer is exchange theory. You give us something, you give us the adherence to the campaign, the behavior, we give you something back. We're driven by market research. Particularly secondary market data is widespread and accessible for the audiences we want to attack. But we use the entire kit, quant qual, secondary, primary, observational, it's all there. If we can study you, learn about you, and understand you, we can help give you something meaningful that you care about and value so that you want to help us, so you want to engage the change. So the other element to this is we mentioned the audience. Segmentation is key. Divide and conquer. We need to know who you are. We need to target you so we can use the whole of the marketing mix. And the last thing we do quite well in social marketing, quite often better than we do in commercial, is so we follow up. We use evaluations and we change our behavior based on evidence. We are some of the origins of evidence-led policy. 
social marketers with their market research driven, evidence driven starting point and our evaluative did change happen follow ups are how evidence led policy got to be so widespread in the first place. But we're not the only game in town. And this is this is learning outcome number three writ large. There are other ways to change the world. I'm going to teach you one. I'm going to teach you social marketing. And we can change the world with social marketing. And we can change it for good or we can change it for good. Because nobody goes out and does social marketing for bad. Because we always believe our campaigns to be for the greater good. So there is that first ethical consideration. But there are other means and mechanisms, and it's very important that you consider these. Sometimes the best way to solve a problem is to just throw science at it. Upgrades with technology, bring laws in to prohibit, bring economics in to price things out, bring taxes in to make it unpalatable, change the infrastructure. If you ban cars, then you're not going to have people driving into each other in those areas. If you rebuild the infrastructure so paths are well lit, wide and accessible, that there are frequent points where people can rest, people will train in those areas. They will gain fitness in those areas. So there's all these ways you can modify the world that isn't marketing. We are one tool. So this is where the question comes down, marketing dialogue. When is it social marketing? When does it need to be social marketing? And this is also going to be an important facet for you, is that once you walk out of this camp, walk out of this course, and you start running these campaigns, you will have people going, oh, I'm a social marketer. Now we do advertising, and that's it. And you sit there going, but where is your product offer? What is your price? How's your distribution? So this is a philosophical one. It's not even resolved inside the academy as to when is it marketing, when is it not marketing. For me, though, these are the critical things. You've got to have the whole mix in there. You've got to have thought price. You must have thought product, distribution, all these things. So you need this. You need these components. And a communications only campaign can only count if you are communicating an idea product. And even then, you ask the question if it's an idea product, isn't it actually a product? So, this is week one, round one, concept framework one. The biggest thing about this is that this opens up. It's not just take the red pill, take the blue pill, how big's this rabbit hole? This is Welcome to a field of rabbit holes. There's a lot of them. But what you need to walk out of this with is knowing I've got a definition, I've got a framework, and I've got a starting point. So as always, connect with me on any of the channels, Twitter, even Instagram, through the email. Come see me if you've got a question on this. But welcome to social marketing. It's big, it's robust. It's full of ideological differences, but it's real, it works, and it makes a difference. So welcome aboard. It's going to be fun.